Ukulele was meant to be a spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie, but was mentioned with mixed reception when it came out. I and many others liked it, but a pretty good amount of people didn't feel too positive about it. Even as someone who enjoyed the game, I'll still admit there was a ton of pretty big problems in that game. Because of this, many assumed Ukulele was a dead IP. I didn't think that. I fully expected a new game at some point, but what I didn't expect was a 2D platformer, this time taking inspiration from the Donkey Kong Country games. Which is interesting. The original ukulele was meant to fill a void left by the absence of collectathon 3D platformers and more specifically Banjo-Kazooie. Not only are 2D platformers very much alive and well, but so is Donkey Kong Country. Because of this, I admittedly wasn't that excited for Impossible Lair. I didn't think it looked bad by any means, it just didn't grab me. Mainly because there are a lot of 2D platformers out there and you really have to do something interesting to grab me. And then the game actually came out and a ton of people were calling it one of the best 2D platformers ever. And a lot of people were praising things that just didn't make any sense to me, like saying the old world is one of the best parts of the game. And like, what? <laughs> So I didn't, I didn't get a lot of the praise, it's just the game didn't look that amazing to me, uh, but I was I still wanted to get it, uh, both because, obviously it's a review channel, because I want to support Playtonic, and then I actually got it, and well, the, the, this video is about my thoughts, so ow, I hit my knee. <laughs> anyway, video time. The game Stories capital B is back with a new device called the Hive Mind, which is a remote that can take control of any bee in the world. He uses this device to take over the royal stingdom's population and make them his slaves. So you have to help a leader of the stingdom, Queen Fee Bee, save her citizens and reclaim the stingdom. My god, the bee puns are out of control in this game. I usually don't like bee puns at all, specifically B, because they usually just involve emphasizing the letter B in words. But the ones in this game are actually pretty creative. I mean, the device that can control bees in this game is called the Hive Mind. That's genius. The whole concept of rescuing the bees actually has a very interesting gameplay mechanic too. The very first level in this game taking place immediately after the tutorial is the Impossible Lair. As the name implies, this level is very, very, very hard. Despite the Impossible Lair technically being the first level in the game, you don't actually have to beat it from the get-go. Instead, you can tackle it whenever you feel like you're ready, and I don't just mean getting ready by building up your skill. No, I mean the Impossible Lair becomes slightly less impossible with each level you beat. Every time you beat a level, you're rewarded with the Royal Stingdom Bee, and these bees act as a shield in the Impossible Lair. Meaning if you save, say, 13 bees, you'll get 13 free additional hit points before actually taking damage in the Impossible Lair. So at literally any point in the game, you can decide you're ready and just go for it. This also means you can theoretically beat the game with no bees at all. And uh, emphasis on theoretically, but more on that later. This probably would remind a lot of people of Breath of the Wild, as it should. That game also had the idea of allowing the player to decide when they're ready to take on the final challenge, but the concept actually stems from Jaws on the NES. I wish I was joking. Regardless on whether or not this idea has been done before, I love seeing it done again because it's such a cool thing that just isn't done often at all, and especially cool seeing this done in a platformer of all things. Oh uh, yeah, I haven't even mentioned that yet, have I? Yes, as you can see with your two eyeballs I would assume you have, this is a 2D platformer. Which, as I've said before, is inspired by Donkey Kong Country. However, this time it's much closer to being its own thing than the first ukulele was. That game, as I said at the end of that video, was a legally distinct Banjo-Kazooie. While Impossible Lair definitely took a few ideas from the EKC games, but it still has a lot of original things going for it too. For starters, the hit point system is very different. It's a mix of Yoshi in the 2D Mario games, Baby Mario and Yoshi's Island, the rings from Sonic the Hedgehog, and the extra Kongs in the modern DKC games. When you get hit, Lele starts flailing around, and if you happen to catch her before she flies away, it undoes any harm. But don't think it'll be easy. I mean, it can. Sometimes Lele will literally fly back into you immediately without you having to do anything, but most of the time it can be pretty tricky to get her back. Sometimes straight up impossible. Lair. <laughs> If you do happen to lose her, you can ring these bells to summon her back, or alternatively, you can just KYS after a checkpoint and she'll be back after you respawn. The reason you'd want to keep her aside from insurance is she actually gives Yuka a couple abilities he wouldn't have otherwise. You can do this tail twirl thing in the air, which allows you to stay in the air a bit longer, making platforming a bit easier. You can also body slam, which is required for some secrets. Without Lele, Yuka feels very handicapped, so it's a very good idea to do everything in your power to keep Lele. Even if that involves suicide? 
Just saying. This game also has tonics. These things were in the original ukulele, but they're a lot more interesting here. For one, this time you can equip more than one. Starting off, you can only equip up to three, but with a special tonic, you can equip four. By using one tonic slot. <laughs> it's actually pretty funny. You can much later get an actual fourth tonic slot, which is nice. They can make the game easier at the cost of a quill subtraction at the end of each level, or they can also make the game harder with a reward being a quill multiplier. You can do things like turn the camera upside down, give every enemy an additional hit point, or darken the screen for additional quills. On the flip side, you can make it so that Lele doesn't flail around nearly as much after taking a hit, keep twit coins even after death, or giving you a tail twirl thing for more distance than your jump. Twirling, twirling towards freedom. Again, at the cost of a quill subtraction at the end of each level. Some tonics don't change your quill total at all, mostly just tonics that change the game visually, like this NES filter or whatever this abomination is. However, there is a tonic that attracts nearby quills to you and that and it doesn't subtract quills from you? I, and I don't, I don't know why. Uh, that's something you probably should just have on 100% of the time. And I would've, but that was one of the last tonics I found, so... Yeah. Anyway, admittedly I mostly didn't bother with tonics because I didn't feel confident enough in my abilities to make the game harder, but I also didn't want to lose out on quills because I knew I was going to need a lot of them if I wanted to buy every tonic. I still needed to grind quills a bit at the end, but it wasn't too bad after following the advice of this YouTube video by Sweet Johnny Cage. Link will be in the description if you're interested. You can easily get well over a thousand quills every couple minutes by using this strategy. Oh yeah, I haven't even gotten over the purpose of quills. Basically, you'd need them so you can buy more tonics or the very occasional hub world item. You can only buy tonics once you find them in the hub, and there's like... a lot? I was only able to find around half of them, naturally. I had to use the walkthrough for the rest of them. There was actually a lot of clever hiding spots with these, but too many of these felt kinda cryptic. Like, one required me to click a very specific spot in the map, and I don't know how they expect anyone to find this considering this is the only time the game where you need to do anything like this and the game never establishes you can do it before. That's another major thing that separates the impossible layer from Donkey Kong, the hub world. At first glance it might just look like the world map from Mario 3D World but there's a ton more to it. I've heard people straight up say this is the best part of the game. If you're anything like me you're probably confused by that statement but trust me it really is great. It almost feels like a classic style Zelda game at points, I mean it's heavily puzzle and exploration based with a top down camera so of course I'm gonna make those comparisons. It's pretty dang meaty too, like look at this map. There's tons of really clever secrets, some even leading to bees only obtainable in the hub, platforming and fun NPCs. One NPC being Trouser, yes the objectively best character has returned. This time he set up literal paywalls and you have to pay him for a certain amount of twit coins in order to pass. Twit coins basically being the star coins from the new Super Mario Bros. games. Trouser is still a lot of fun in this game, I love seeing games make fun of unfortunately common greedy business practices in the gaming industry. Also his house burns down and he spends the rest of their game crying so that's pretty cool. I wouldn't say the hub is the best part of the game like a lot of others, but it's definitely a lot better than I expected it to be and it's a very nice break from the main levels. And it's actually slightly reminiscent of the first game except at a much more manageable scale. Like I said before, the puzzles here can be really great. I especially love the ones where you need to find a way to affect the Grand Tomes in some way. Freezing them, covering them in honey, getting a giant fan to blow them. These actions actually affect the levels in really unique ways. Every level has two variants, the normal version and the altered version. You access the altered version by finding a way to alter the Grand Tome that leads into the particular level. Flood the level with enemies, now it's a chase level. Aim a giant fan at it, now there's a huge storm going on. Enter a level when it's on a well, now you gotta climb the level vertically. When I first heard this was a feature, I was worried it would make half the levels feel like retreads, but that's just not the case. These levels are barely recognizable when you alter them. Some of the set pieces are the same, but most of the time the altered levels would have you go through entirely different pathways not accessible through the normal version. This really ended up being my favorite thing about the game. It just gets so creative and I'm kinda shocked that I haven't seen anything like this done before. I mean, I guess the original ukulele kinda had something like this with the whole level expansion thing, but that's a lot lamer by comparison. My only complaint with this is you can very occasionally see pathways not available in the version of the level you're playing, and that can get very confusing when you're just going for every twit coin. Uh, that's pretty rare if I'm being honest, so whatever. So yeah, those are the main things separating this from Donkey Kong Country. 
Other than that, the level design does feel pretty similar to it at points, uh, more specifically the more recent Donkey Kong Country games. It's admittedly nowhere near as hard, but still, they even have those cannon barrels and they work exactly the same way. The level design doesn't get nearly as crazy or honestly even as creative as, say, Tropical Freeze, but I don't think any other game does, so that's fine. Also, that game probably had a much bigger budget. The level design is still very good, and just like DKC, it has a certain sense of flow that you start to pick up on later playthroughs, and it gives it a ton more replayability. It feels super great to just breeze through these levels when you can do it. It can get pretty challenging too, uh, shout out to this one part where I should have died twice in the span of 10 seconds. Seriously, look at that, I was like a frame away from death, how did I do that? I do have one big issue with the level design though, the twit coins combined with the length of the levels was kinda ruining the game for me at first. The levels in this game can be pretty long, sometimes approaching 10 minutes, and combine that with easy to miss collectibles, it wasn't great for me. Missing these coins can suck knowing you're going to have to redo at least 5 minutes of gameplay. You might say Tropical Freeze did the same thing, and yeah, the length of those levels are pretty comparable, but the Kong letters weren't really hidden, they were just hard to get to, meaning you very rarely need to replay levels in that game. Constantly scanning through these levels and getting overly stressed whenever I see I missed one, was kind of ruining the game for me at first. Once I decided to not care as much and just go for the any coins I missed later, I did start having a much better time, but even still, I think it would be better if they either have shorter levels with hidden twit coins, or levels of the current length with hard to get but easy to see twit coins. I suppose this is more of a preference thing and most players probably wouldn't care about getting every twit coin anyway, so this is probably more of a me issue if I'm being honest, but it annoyed me and this is my video so shut up. One thing that kept me going when the Twit Coins were ruining the game for me was the music because, oh my god, it is incredible! David Wise and Grant Kirkhope returned from the first game, along with Dan Murdoch composing for the series for the first time, but to me, the real star is Matt Griffin because his songs are easily the best and I can't get enough of them. Production Path was like one of the first major standouts to me and I couldn't help but hum along with that melody while playing. But man, Windy Way and its variant are easily the best songs in the game. Windmill Way Windy specifically is probably one of the best songs I've heard since A Hat in Time, and if you follow me on Twitter, you might know I can't go a week without gushing about that soundtrack, so that's basically the best compliment I can possibly give. There are so many amazing songs in this game, and if for whatever reason you have no plans on playing this game, you should by the way, but if you for some reason still don't plan on doing it, please at least listen to this soundtrack, there's a ton of really great stuff here. I guess I should probably talk about the Impossible Lair. I know it's technically the first level in the game, but it'll be the last level for most people, so... The Impossible Lair is one of the hardest levels I've played in a platformer, and I don't know if you can tell from my channel, but I've played a lot of those. Even with the maximum amount of bees, this level took me a few hours. Let me reiterate. Even with 48 additional hit points, this took me 3 hours. The amount of ridiculously tight jumps in the 30 minute length makes this level one of the most intense endings I've played in a video game. Seriously, I was actually out of breath by the time I actually finished this level because I was so close to failing yet again. And let me re-reiterate, I had 48 additional hits. I can't imagine what it would be like without those bees. 
I was originally going to try, I mean, I've 100% of the PS1 Crash 1 more than anyone ever should. I've completed Death Witch from hand time. Mostly. I'm no stranger to ridiculously hard challenges. I can do that. No, I can't! Maybe I could if I decided I just didn't need my sanity anymore by spending 30 hours of my life on it. But as much as I like 100%ing games for these videos, you people aren't worth it. Actually, it could very easily take me longer than 30 hours considering it took the completionist 60. Oh my god, why did he do that? Does that man have no limits? Anyway, with the bees, well, still very hard, it's still manageable. I didn't like it at first because dying so late in this level felt really annoying because that's 30 minutes of progress down the drain. This isn't even 100% completion reward, it's just a thing you have to do to beat the game. It's a pretty massive difficulty spike. Normally when platformers do the whole one final challenge thing, it's usually a 100% reward like in the more recent 3D Mario games, uh, but this is just a thing you have to do to beat the game. And it honestly makes anything Mario has thrown at me feel like nothing in comparison. That being said, the very noticeable increase in my skill level with each attempt felt really rewarding and that feeling I got when I actually beat the level was incredible. I don't remember the last time a game made me feel like that. I was a little sour towards the level at first, but everything was so worth it when I actually beat it, so I ended up loving the level. So while my previous points still stand, I feel like the accomplishment I got from actually beating it made, it made me not care. So yeah, that was impossible there. You really can't go wrong with any version of this game. They all look beautiful and run at 60 FPS, even Switch. Again, ignore the 30 FPS you've been seeing in this video, my capture card only records in 30. Anyway, the Switch version is barely even a graphical downgrade at all. The only difference is it runs at 720p instead of 80, so the Switch version might be the version to pick up for the portability. I say might because the Switch version is $10 more for whatever reason. I know the Switch tax is a thing, but that only applies to games that require a larger cart size and the Impossible Lair isn't one of those games, so I'm not really sure what's going on there. I don't want to assume anything, though. Either way, I mostly just got on PS4 because that's where I got the first ukulele physically, and it looks nice in my collection. That's it. I know. Though, to be honest, I'll probably pick it up and switch anyway. There was a pretty sizable demo, too, which is how I got my Switch footage, so if you're still unsure about the game, Play it there. Any progress you make will carry on to the full game, so don't worry about having to redo things. The demo even includes the impossible lair, so you can theoretically beat the game without paying a cent. Uh, again, good luck if you decide to do that. The impossible lair ended up being so much better than I thought it'd be. Is it better than Tropical Freeze? I don't think so, but not many games are, and it's still very much worth playing. This is such a good game. The addition of tonics, the hub world, and especially the alternate levels honestly makes this game stand out quite a bit, which is something a lot of 2D platformers struggle with. And man, I did not, I did not get that impression from the trailer. Uh, and I'm very happy I ended up being wrong about this game because, oh my god, it is good. It even addressed one of my main complaints about the original game, how uh, Ukulele, the original, didn't really stand out all that much. It was basically a legally distinct Banjo-Kazooie. Uh, but then in this game, no, it definitely has its own identity. That being said, as good as this game is, I, I still want a Ukulele. I still think there is a lot more potential with a more open ended 3D platformer approach and there's a lot of room for improvement. Though, I am still very happy we got this game, it, it, though it is a shame to see it doesn't seem like it's doing that great. Yeah, aside from a handful of YouTubers, I haven't seen too many people talk about this game. Heck, it says 7% of people on PS4 got the Platinum Trophy, which from my experience usually means not too many people bought the game. And that sucks, this is genuinely one of the best 2D platformers I've played, but I just haven't seen anyone talk about it. Yeah, I'm sad. I, I wanted to do better. Uh, but hey, hey, I, I sure will still see more from Platonic, and I'm very excited to see what that could be. Uh, as for what my next video is, I don't know. I'm deciding between a couple things. I have an idea, but you will see then. Uh, so I'll see you then. Oh, and uh, before this video ends, you might notice the... Uh, camera quality is very different. That's because my camera broke and I'm currently using my phone. Uh, me getting that set up took like a week because our tripod mount wasn't... Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, I don't know if this camera quality is better or worse. Either way, I guess it doesn't matter because I was planning on getting a new camera anyway within the next six or so months. So, uh, this is only temporary. 
If it sucks, I'm sorry, but I guess my camera sucked to begin with, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, bye. See you guys in the next video.